So we're six events into season two of Sail GP. Just two more to go, Sydney and then the grand finale in San Francisco next year. The latest, however, has just been in Cadiz. It's the last stop of the European tour and what an event it was. We had a bit of everything and it rattled the nerves of even some of the best hotshot sailors. Once again, I have one of the best seats in the house, up in Ealing, as it happens, helping out with some of the TV production up there for the event. So if you've missed the action so far, this is one you really want to check out. 26 minutes of what happened in Cadiz. Eight events, three to go, one million dollars. Reputations at stake and Spain, the next stop. The pressure came from both ends, from like tricky to big and punchy. It was crunch time in Cadiz. Basking in the sun, the historic town of Cadiz in Andalusia in southwest Spain welcomes the world's best racing yachtsman in the first ever Spain Sail Grand Prix. One of the oldest cities in Western Europe, Cadiz has been a major base for exploration trade since the 16th century. Today, it's the home of the Spanish Navy and a hugely popular tourist attraction with its beaches, monuments and museums and renowned restaurants all enjoying the attractive Mediterranean climate. With the added attraction this weekend on the bay of the sixth event of Sail GP Season 2. Home team expectations had drawn a big crowd as the Spanish team prepared to take to the local waters. And it wasn't just spectators that had arrived. The Cadiz event had also attracted royal attention as His Majesty King Felipe VI stepped aboard with double world championship medalist Jordi Shamar at the helm on practice day. Later, the King presented New Zealand with the Juan Sebastian de Alcano Trophy after winning the one-off race to celebrate the 500th anniversary of the first circumnavigation of the globe. Earlier in the week, key members of a new team from Switzerland who will be joining Sail GP next season stepped aboard the Spanish boat to get a taste of what will be in store. Driver Sebastian Schneider took control of the F-50. Switzerland will take to nine the number of teams in season three with word that a tenth team is also about to be announced. The sixth event in the Sail GP season, Cadiz, was set to deliver some big changes. For the French team, humiliation in Saint-Tropez and a last place in the overall rankings had triggered some tough talk. Unforced error by the French again, and that's just not acceptable. France, you have a penalty outstanding. I don't think we have a penalty. Yes, we have one. Okay. The Afghans were flying, they paid their own ticket to come here to support us and they look at the result, they're not interested. We all look like idiots today, and it's not good. Big change in our, in our team. We changed the driver, we replaced um, Billy Besson by Quentin Lapierre. That's better, that's the one. Yeah, this phone call just came right after Saint-Tropez. Uh, was a huge, huge call for me. The guys on this league are just the best in the world and uh, now I have the, the opportunity to sail against them. I just want to catch it, just to be um, really concentrate on my role on board and 
try to improve myself every day. Quentin is a um, very smart young French sailor. He's a, he's a really good leader. I know the rules, I know the, the level of this league, and I also know that uh, probably 50 guys in France want my job. Do I have the face of somebody who wants to finish last? That's not my point. I'm putting myself out of my comfort zone and I'm taking the team with me. Yeah, he's taking a risk, but it's also a huge opportunity for him just to try to change something and I think it's a good risk. But there was one change that was to affect all the teams as the Sail GP Pathway program saw female athletes step aboard. It's a milestone weekend as the Women's Pathway athletes get to race for the first time in Sail GP Cadiz. Racing with the Australians, Nina Curtis, Olympic silver medalist and two-time Australian Female Sailor of the Year. Senna Takano is used to racing in high-pressure environments as she's just competed in her home Olympics in Tokyo. It's going to be challenging for all the female sailors, but uh, I think uh, we will do very well. CJ Perez is now the youngest athlete in the fleet and has just won the WASP National Championships in America. Sail GP is at the forefront of the most high-tech pieces of machinery and I'm so happy that I can be a part of this. Erica Dawson is just back from the Tokyo Olympics and she will be rejoining her Kiwi Olympic teammates. It's really awesome to see this progression in women's sailing for us to get out there racing on the boats. Katia Sauskoff Iverson is a bronze medalist from Rio 2016 and is considered one of the best crews on the circuit. I'm super excited about today. It's going to be an important role with a lot of action. Amelie Ryu is a sailing all rounder. She brings offshore experience and foiling knowledge from the NACRA class. It will be really cool on board and really fun. Andrea Ermini is a data analyst that will help the boat go faster, aiming for the Olympics, Paris 2024. Hannah Mills is the greatest female Olympic sailor of all time with two golds and one silver. There is no doubt she will be a strong tactical voice this weekend. It's a massive game changer. There's a really good mix um, and a lot of talent. We're fast approaching the business end of the Sail GP season with the top three teams separated by just two points. It could be crunch time in Cadiz. Japan opened the leaderboard up with victory in Saint-Tropez last month. But can they stay in front? Because both victories have been in light and fluky Mediterranean breezes, which wind whisperer Nathan Outridge loves. You don't mess with Nathan Outridge on a light, shifty day, do you? So the question is, if the wind increases, will he and his talented crew keep up their winning ways? The USA team have finally had a series without breaking things, including themselves, finishing second behind Japan to jump up to second place overall. And the Americans will make it two for two on 9-11. There's optimism on board, particularly with the return of flight controller Rome Kirby. Can their A team bring its A game to Cadiz? Tied with the USA on 35 points and going backwards is Australia, who had a shocker in Saint-Tropez with an unprecedented last place. We just got to suck it up and come last. Oh, this is Tom Slingsby and he is having a whinge. Yes, they were unlucky with equipment failures on day one, but then when they had it all to play for on day two, their results included an embarrassing eighth place. Surely Tom Slingsby and crew need to bounce back in Cadiz and fast. Speaking of shockers, consider Great Britain, who slipped back to fourth overall after a poor sixth place in Saint-Tropez. It looked OK at the start of the series. Race number one goes the way of Great Britain Sail GP at Saint-Tropez. Only for a disastrous move in race five, which cost penalty points, okay. damaging their overall leaderboard position. Too small a gap, Ben. Surely you're not going to fit through there. Surely that's too tight. Oh, big incident. There is still time for the British, though, and Ainsley's rivals know that an angry Ainsley is tough to beat. A Spanish podium finish in Saint-Tropez gave Phil Robertson and his crew just enough points to stay in touch with the leaders. Robertson appeared back to his aggressive best on the French coming waters, up, up, which will please up, the Spanish up, faithful. Mason, look at this, Phil Robertson oh, with that contact coming. Oh, Peter Burling must stay clear. It was an aggressive move by Robertson. 
Now they're on home waters, which should be an advantage, and the question is whether they can register their first series win of the year to stay in the hunt. Ahead of season two, many have the Kiwis as favourites, but their results haven't reflected this at all. They sit a disappointing sixth in the leaderboard. They haven't made a single podium, in fact, they've not even won a single race, except with substitute driver Arno Sarafagas. And the Kiwis are sitting their first win of the season here in Sail GP. Drastic improvement is crucial if they're to qualify for the season final. Denmark remain a work in progress and must be out of contention for the big prize. Saint-Tropez was better, their second win and a third denied by a broken jib sheet that kept them off the podium. But surely it's too little too late for Nikolai Sehested and his Vikings. The weather forecast suggested that Cadiz would see two ends of the scale, starting with light conditions for the opening day. This meant that the teams would be sailing with their large 29 meter wings and their lighter weather foils and light weather rudders. For the course, each race would see the fleet set off across the wind before rounding Mark 1 and hitting downwind to the first gate, where the quickest way to the bottom is not direct. Once through the gate, as boats can't sail directly into the wind, they tack across the course, often splitting from their opponents to find the strongest breeze and the best wind direction. After the top gate, it's downwind again, where they repeat this for two or three laps, depending on the wind strength, before passing through the last gate to head to the finish in front of the crowds. The start of the opening race saw Great Britain and Australia set the pace to get their noses ahead of the pack by Mark 1. Great start for Slingsby, he needs this. Free from the melee behind, it was a match race at the front, with Tom Slingsby's team maintaining the upper hand. Yet conceding a win is not in Ainsley's DNA. On the final leg, his Olympic triple medalist tactician Hannah Mills spotted an opportunity on the opposite side of the course. Potential lead change with Ainsley, Mills working beautifully tactically at the back of the boat. Okay. Minutes Three, later, one. the British had taken the lead, but only just. At the finish, it was close, very close, as Great Britain took the win in Cadiz. Oh, oh that was insane, I love yeah. that. Good hustle. The start of race two was a frantic affair for the British and New Zealand teams who jumped the gun at the start. Both had to clear their penalties, something that proved tricky. Meanwhile, the Spanish scorched off to take an early lead, chased by Japan who held their nerve and their advantage to the end. A win was in the bag in front of their home crowd. Light and shifty winds were helping to mix fortunes, and the final race of the day saw Australia in pole position. And while Slingsby and his crew were taking nothing for granted, the Australian driver couldn't conceal his frustration on the final leg. Oh my God, how do we do that? The Americans had passed through the penultimate gate in third. To improve their position, they had to split from the leaders, gambling that the other side of the course would pay out. And seconds later, it did launching them into the lead. One day, three races, and three different winners. After a turbulent day on the race course, there was just one point between the Australians and the Americans. But three points further behind, four teams were fighting over two points. There was plenty to think about overnight. Day two was shaping up to be an intense affair with some punchy weather forecast on top. Day two here in Cadiz was a big one, and everyone knew it. Every team had something to prove. For the new French driver, Quentin Delapierre, the tough conditions would deliver a baptism of fire. Japan needed to prove that they could handle the breeze as well as they could perform in the light. 
Australia and USA would be fighting to remain in the top three overall and in the regatta, while the British and the Spanish had to step up their games to get into this leading pack. And then there were the Danes, a team on the edge of a big step up. Everyone had something to prove. But as day two got underway, there was an issue that all teams shared, the conditions. Big breeze, big gusts, and plenty of nerves. At the moment, yes, it is survival out here. It's uh, probably not so much the amount of wind, it's just uh, the position of the race course that makes it really puffy. Uh, the water's pretty flat, that's manageable, but the bullets that we get out here are pretty extreme, so there's a, you go from pretty light winds to a lot of wind very quickly, and it's very hard to predict. As they headed out to the race course, the Spanish got hit by a big gust and took a nosedive. Look at the crew oh. fall into the wing there, wow. The crew were safe, but their campaign was now at risk, raising a big question. Was crashing becoming a habit? It's quite a big difference between Denmark and here. That was probably one of the more, that, that was an error on our part in breaking a board, a foil uh, here. We had a shocker and it was uh, quite a hectic capsize to be honest, we pitch pulled it, which is super easy to do, it's just so much load, a lot of, a lot of wind, uh, and yeah, <laughs> we got it wrong. The wing's taken quite a big knock, um, we've lost a lot of it, uh, the boat's pretty damaged everywhere, so yeah, it's uh, not a great day. Obviously it's a lot of points that are going and to be honest, this one will be really hard to come back from. I think it might have uh, sunk our season a bit, but uh, look, we'll fight hard, we always do. For the rest of the fleet, the opening minutes of race four were explosive. I cannot tell you how well Nikolai Sehested did there. That was incredible reactions. As the Australians struggled to regain control, the fleet hammered into the first jibe. Look That's how high, high. he's That's flying, really high. oh my life, what a jive there, this is action packed, Luke Parkinson, the Wild West Australian flying that boat incredibly high. The action remained intense into gate two. Flying really high out the water there, Outridge manages to stay inside though, it was calm on board there, look out for the Kiwi boat. And once around, it was New Zealand that settled down into a blistering pace, hitting 60 kilometers an hour upwind and finding a gear that others could not reach. At gate three, they were leading. And while every maneuver presented a risk and the pressure from the British continued, Kiwi confidence was building. By the finish, their win was a big moment. Not only had they survived, but after plenty of expectation, the Kiwis had now delivered the team's first win with Peter Burling at the helm. But they still had a mountain to climb to get into the final. With one race to go until the cut, it was Australia, USA and Great Britain that led the charge. A slingshot start for Ainsley. A high speed drag race for the rest. By gate two, the front runners had found a rhythm in the breeze. Ainsley was going well, but not well enough to cross the Japanese team. Here we go, Ben Ainsley, big maneuver here to get behind the right of way Japanese boat. Forced to duck behind them, the British were now in second with France in third. One lap later, the order remained with Australia in fourth, enough to get them into the final. But with one leg to go, Slingsby and crew wanted more. And by splitting with the front runners up the last leg, they found it. Just. It looks like he's making it. If he can sneak round this right turn, it will then be a three boat drag race to the finish. Who's going to be brave enough? Slingsby, perfect judgment on the mark rounding there. What a move from third to first on this upwind leg. Losing a place as they approached the line made no difference to Japan. The die had been cast. The final cut made, but just one winner to come. The shootout would be between Australia, America, and Great Britain. Three teams, three heavy weather experts. 
But alongside the racing afloat, there is another championship running behind the scenes. The Impact League has a set of social and environmental sustainability criteria from pioneering new technologies, focusing on clean energy solutions and removing all single-use plastics to diversity and inclusion and using the team's voice for good. Each team is audited and awarded points based on its fulfillment of these criteria. Ahead of the Spain Sail GP, Nathan Outridge's Team Japan discussed how they could work on this area. I thought that what we could do is if we brought two or three solar panels, we could power our base with 12 volt lighting instead of using alternating current mains voltage electricity. Um, and I'm confident that apart from the winches, which is the only thing that we would need that voltage for, we could do pretty much everything in the base with 12 volt power and a battery bank. That's great. So that's exactly the sort of idea that they're looking for. So on this topic, Chris, are you able to put it together a little sort of half page or one page on what the proposal could be yeah. that we could then submit with our impact lead yeah. and then we could then find a way to then follow through for, say, Sydney? Mm -hmm. So I think just being a bit more conscious and I think we'll easily get another 15 points, which will probably have us coming second or third or first even quite easily. At every Sail GP event, keen sailors under the age of 21 are invited to compete just a stone's throw away from the F-50s. The criteria for selection is based on sailing ability, a positive attitude, and a willingness to learn. And the reward? Getting to sail alongside some of the best in the world and a taste of future stardom themselves. It all comes under the wider Sail GP Inspire umbrella, aiming to help diversify the sport of sailing and to encourage youngsters to enjoy the thrills and spills of flying on the water. The final. Points no longer mattered. Winning this race did. The breeze was up, the adrenaline pumping, as the bar was raised even higher. And at the start, it was pedal to the metal for all three teams. Best angle and fastest at the gun, it's Ainsley. He should lead from here at Mark 1, but how brave are you feeling, Ben? It's the voice of Ian Jensen, they're flying too hard. Stop. They've stuffed They're it, in. this could be over, They're capsize in. coming. Oh, oh, and a capsize no. for Great Britain in the finale. Oh. And so now it is two boats battling for the title as Australia sails away. Oh, and there's a problem with the American boat. Tom Slingsby, what a job here. Turning downwind, he's done a great job at the start. We know how brave he is, Slingsby. In the drama, the Americans had hit the E button an emergency bailout option which pauses and reboots their onboard systems. All they could do now was to sit and wait to regain control as they watched the Australians scorch off into the distance. But even then, as the saying goes, to finish first, first you have to finish. Slingsby's crew had to get their F-50 around the course and with two capsizes in the day and plenty more near misses, finishing was far from a given. And when they did, the relief was clear to see. Last in San Tropez, first in Cadiz. The Australians had been on a roller coaster ride this season. Uh, I think we had the best seats in the house for that capsize. Uh, yeah, they were going so quick, and uh, we saw them get a little high on the foils. And then I think he might have lost a bit of steerage, and the boat started bearing away. And oh, they were they were going so quick and then we saw them go into the capsize and uh, glad to hear everyone's okay and uh, but yes yeah, as I said it's a game of survival today and uh, yeah very happy with our team we did an amazing job and took the win what hadn't been clear in the drama after the start was just how close the Australians had come to disaster and how quickly they had to react Stevie Morrison considers what that looked like in the heat of the moment and the first thing I want us to look at is the jib trim on the British boat. As we circle the jib there, there's wind blowing between that jib and pushing back onto the big wing sail. It means you can't ease the wing sail out because the jib's sheeted in too tightly. 
the rudder underneath Ben Ainsley, well that's offering downforce when it's in the water. The downforce from that helps keep the boat upright and it drives the boat, gives us that extra horsepower to get these incredible speeds. Unfortunately, they get a gust of wind. They start to heal because the wing won't ease out. We zoom in now on the rudder. It's out of the water. There's a big problem here. Yes, they've eased the jib out, but unfortunately, as soon as the rudder leaves the water, all that writing moment's gone and there's just a tipping force from the wind which is making the boat heel over. The boat goes down, capsize, incredible reactions from Tom Slingsby and from here he goes on to take the win. And the celebration well underway on board Australia Sail Grand Prix. Welcome Nina Curtis. I've just got so much confidence in our team. They were so impressive under pressure and especially the pressure of the conditions and it was a very calm feeling on board the boat today. So that will wrap things up here in Cadiz, Spain for round number six of Sail GP. And it's the Australians who lead the way after six rounds with 45 points. A tie in second between the Americans on 44, also with 44 points, is Japan. Then it's Great Britain sitting in fourth place, and they'll be looking for some big points when we head to the next event in Sydney, Australia, December 17th and 18th of 2021. So on behalf of Ali Vance, Freddie Carr, and Stevie Morrison, I'm Todd Harris saying adios for now. We'll see you next time down in Australia. One, look at the speed. Hitting Whoa. close to 90. Stuffed in, this could be over, capsize coming.